Uh, I was going to say what you were reminding me of is the, the XKCD space bar heater thing. Have yeah. you ever seen that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it comes up every you know, day. It's tough. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh, all the time. It's, it's all fun and games in the first five years of a project, but once you get kind of further down the road, there becomes these weird philosophical cliffs that you find yourself standing over like, okay, well, it's not really a bug, but it's also not really something we want to keep. Uh, but also people are using it and we're, our whole goal is supposed to be to satisfy our users, but like, is there a greater good here? So it can be very difficult to make those decisions. I, I really understand. If we as a library, as yeah. the first step already make that error, uh, we, we ship it to hundreds of thousand users, then hundreds of thousand users have that error and they have that inconsistent data somewhere in there. Uh, so we have to make sure from the beginning that every single render is perfectly on point. This is what peak library authorship looks like. This team has endured through so many changes in the React ecosystem over the years as things fall in and out of Vogue or the TypeScript world. Certainly in the GraphQL world, things have been changing and they've been able to keep up with all of those changes and manage to keep a really good strong will, a good will in the community. I mean, if you've done any GraphQL anything, there's no doubt that you've come across Apollo. You've seen that their docs are fantastic. So there's no way you haven't seen these tools. And it shows why that is and how they're able to keep up with that. It's a big challenge at this point in the in the project to be able to stay relevant, but they've managed to do it. And so they kind of give us, you know, unlock the, the castle and we walk around inside and get to see the code. We get to see how they manage all of that and maintain that relevancy through all of this time. It's pretty amazing. And they show some pretty innovative stuff. We spent a lot of time looking at code. Near the end, there's some extremely exciting, very fresh ideas that they're bringing to the table on how they test their library and make sure that it's performing and check for memory leaks and stuff like that so very very deep technical stuff going on here and it's such a treat to have these people on the channel i hope you enjoy let us know what you think welcome everyone we got apollo client here very excited to do this showcase uh we we, we got gerald and lens on the line uh, lens you've seen before with the redux showcase that we did before gerald i don't think we've met you before why don't could you introduce yourself and then we'll go to lens uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm Gerald Miller, uh, as uh, Dimitri said. So I live in Colorado uh, with my wife and, and four-year-old daughter uh, and my dog Thor. I've uh, been here for, well, I guess a year. Uh, I grew up here, moved to Portland, came back uh, a year ago. So now I've been here. But uh, yeah, I've been at, been at Apollo Client, or been with Apollo, I should say, for a little over a year or so now, uh, maintaining, uh, primarily working on uh, Apollo Client. So uh, yeah, it's been super fun to to dive into the open source world and and uh, be on that full time. The air is quite thin up there in Colorado. The last time I went, <laughs> I was like <laughs> struggling to breathe. Uh, I hear that that's a lot awesome. for sure. <laughs> you get used to it, though, eventually, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't notice it. How about you, Lens? What's the air like for you? Cold outside, I think. And a little bit wet. Um, so yeah, hi, uh, my name is Lance Webertronic. I'm on the Apollo Client team since February of last year. And we do Apollo Client, we do the dev tools, we do a few other packages, like, like we do a lot of the open source stuff at Apollo. Um, I also do other open source, so you've seen me from Redux the last time. Uh, so I'm already in the open source game for a little bit longer. But uh, this is my first job doing the thing really full time, and it's a whole other beast. <laughs> so uh, the beast, the beast is popular, though. I mean, Apollo Client has a lot of I would say it has a very good uh, buy in. Like there's a good feeling in the community from anything. Anytime I see something about Apollo, it's usually pretty positive. Um, I mean, why do you, I, I want to know so much. I have so many questions, like ethereal questions, but <laughs> let's just start with like the specifics. What is Apollo Client? How does it, uh, how does it do what it do? Okay. Big, big I, picture. I, I start on that one. Um, Apollo Client is a GraphQL client and it does things like doing the request for you, catching it for you, giving you hooks so you can just use these hooks in your components. Um, so if you look at it like that, it's very similar to something like a uh, React query. The thing is, it's a GraphQL client and it's aware that it's using GraphQL. So it's using this awareness over the data format and the fact that there's a specific data shape 
to automatically normalize the cache for you. So if you get uh, three responses in and they have an overlap, the last response will update the two responses you got before that. So all the data on the screen is up to date at once. And that's something that would set it apart from using a non-GraphQL client for GraphQL work. That's why if you're using GraphQL, you want to use it. Does that mean that the data shape is different uh, as far as what's the, what the server responses return compared to what Apollo client is storing and caching locally? There's like some differences yeah. there? We, we oh, always wow. okay. try to, to find uh, an ID. And if you have an outgoing request, we all always add this type name field. And that's like just part of the GraphQL standard. Every server has to support that. So we always get a, a type and an ID back and we combine those into a hopefully globally unique ID and use that to denormalize every response, put that normalized in the cache and then um, get all of your uh, results out of the cache when you need them. And that of course means it, it uses less memory. You save on a lot of requests you probably don't have to make because you already have the data and everything is always in sync. And even like if you send off a mutation uh, and the mutation response already contains enough information, you can use that to update your whole UI and you don't need to make any other uh, queries or refetch anything and, and everything is up to date all the time. Update your UI optimistically then in that case, right? Well, it, it, in that case would, would be pessimistic because you would wait for the, the answer from, <laughs> okay. from the mutation. <laughs> Um, so optimistic would mean you, um, you take an assumed answer that you might get from the mutation and you write that to the cache. You can do that too, but in this case, it's a pessimistic update. So per, per default, we wait for the response from the server, but we merge that into the cache. So if, if you fire up a mutation and that contains everything you need as cache update, then you have uh, a... Okay fully updated cache after the request has finished with the real data I that came from like, the server. Yeah, like what happens if the request fails, or the mutation fails, it would, the UI would flick, would like flicker, right? Or no? Well, if, if you made an optimistic update and that went wrong, then you had to undo that optimistic update, yeah. Um, that, that's yeah. actually something that Apollo Client also does. We have uh, like cache layers and there's an optimistic layer so that can be added and removed without being merged into the into the main cache. Um, oh, cool. And you even can have like multiple optimistic layers active at the same time and remove one of them and stuff like that. Uh, all of that works. Wow. What would you say is the main use case for Apollo client? Like, what do you think the, like your primary customer persona looks like? Well, hopefully everybody who has a GraphQL API um, <laughs> runs anything interactive in the browser that exists for a longer amount of time. Um, like like if, you're, if you're on a server, you might get away with just uh, sending an HTTP request and passing the response. But if you have a longer living cache uh, that you want to keep updated from many different responses, then having a normalized uh, in-memory cache is important for you. You know, I'll add to that too. We've seen, we've seen adoption on basically any scale. So I, I myself have used it a lot on side projects even before I joined Apollo. I know there's a lot of lot of uh, devs out there that will pull it in for their own personal and side projects, but also used uh, in, in pretty large enterprise uh, organizations as well to do stuff. So I, I don't know if it's if it's easy to nail down like a single persona, but just, yeah, as I think Lens put it perfectly, just hopefully anybody that's using a GraphQL API uh, will, cho will choose Apollo client to uh, to handle all of that for you. Wow, that's a great place to be. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, yeah. what is the other, there's like Relay, is, is Relay still a thing? Sure is, yeah. It is. Yeah, yeah so it, it's, it was the first one, because it was, uh, for, if I remember correctly, it was announced at the same time GraphQL was announced uh, way back in, mm. I, if I remember the, the year right, it was 2016. Uh, I, I could be getting that wrong, so don't quote me on that. But yeah, so it was, it was kind of the first one, but it's gone through some some major changes and, and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Apollo Client was one of the first competitors, if you will, to it. Uh, I know it was early on to, to the GraphQL space, so... But yeah, no, Relay is still, uh, still used by 
by devs out there and and uh they're still still moving that package along i think it's on like v15 or 16 at this point so i have a funny embarrassing story to tell about that uh back in then and and i think it would sounds 20 2016 sounds right i was interviewing people for a engineering position and one of the candidates asked me hey do you guys have you looked into graphql and i said no we use d3 <laughs> And uh, and the, my the other interviewer was like, like elbowing me, like, no, you idiot! It has nothing to do with charts and graphs. It's a completely different thing. I was like, oh, okay, I nice. just thought from the name. <laughs> okay, anyway, shows what I know. Well, honestly, uh, like like everybody of us had like a thought like that when when they heard GraphQL in the beginning. Like, you you're not thinking about a data transport protocol. Totally. Yeah. So is there a is there a demo of or is there a small kind of use case that you can show us that we can see the code for like how the kind of the external view from the outside, what it looks like when somebody uses Apollo client very superficially, you know, like a hello world type of thing? Yeah, we have we have our docs, obviously, that, that will have a bunch of code samples uh, samples. We, we don't have like, a I would say, hello world, maybe our like error reproduction yeah, template maybe qualifies that. as that but yeah like yeah, a to do to do app or something any any like simple the, the the problem is uh the the good demo project we have is big um that's the spotify showcase it's a full clone of the spotify client but if, if you start looking at that oh, wow. we, we're going to look at that for quite a while um and this of course <laughs> has been modified quite a bit so let me undo all the changes um so this is a very very basic use um we have our query defined up here so this is a graphql query um we use this gql tag mm -hmm. to parse it into an ast uh you just write your query as normal here mm -hmm. and then you would say something like use query all people uh you could add uh, options here with variables um if your query has variables, this query doesn't have variables. And um, mm -hmm. then you get an object back that contains like the loading state, the data. Uh, other stuff you have on here is um, variables that were used the last time, the error, the previous data, um, and a bunch of helper methods like fetch more, refetch, uh, start polling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Subscribe. Yeah. And so, okay, down here you have the same that, with mutations. I have some questions just based on that. Yeah. So, so all people is a string. By the time it gets to line thirty nine. Uh, no. As soon as it goes through this GQL here, it gets passed into an abstract syntax tree because we can operate on that. Uh -huh. We we uh, like what what um what a the client does before it sends it off to the network is. Uh, insert this uh, type name here uh, because that's something that we need for for caching for for the normalization of the cache so that gets added in uh, but the user doesn't have to write it and we don't do string manipulation there we we do abstract syntax tree manipulation so um, that's why this gql tag internally parses the whole thing um, you don't need to do that at runtime there's also stuff like um, parsing this as a build step um, and only bundling the build AST or using a code gen for that. But in ma most cases, you would still write it like this. The last time I used uh, GraphQL, I used Mercurius and Urkel. I think were the two that I used the most. What is the... So I had lots of questions. Now I get to ask you... <laughs> Uh, so what is the type of all people then if it's not a string? It's an AST, but does it contain the data? So if like you hover over data on line 39, does it give you a thing with an ID and a name eventually? Not in this explicit case, because it's like the most simple uh, demo that we can set up. And we, this is J JavaScript okay. file. Um, so there's not even TypeScript in here. Oh, JSX. Um, if this were a TypeScript file, um, you would be using uh, some kind of code chain in the background. It would generate codes, uh, types for you for the response type. And then this would be a, mm -hmm. a typed a document node with the types from the code chain. So I think the return type is first. Yeah. 
So this would be uh, something like uh, people uh, ID string name string. Um, and you, you wouldn't write this like you would get this all from the code gen. Um, and then if you come yep. down here and hover over data, you, you get it. Uh, so type document node is a very, very clever little hack um, to annotate that. And yeah, you never write type document node by hand in a real application. But here we just change from a JavaScript file. And, and is that the so so CodeGen is the kind of state of the art for how people are accomplishing it these these days? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, there's GraphQL coach, and I think that's used by most people. The reason I was asking, maybe I should just say it. The I know that there was somebody working on a an an LSP. I mean, obviously, at build time, you need to build it eventually. But I thought I thought there was somebody working on an LSP plugin. LSP plugins don't really exist for the most part, but they kind of do. Uh, and I think somebody was working on a way to do this dynamically as you are typing, so you don't have to save files and have like file watch loops running to build the types. Um, but you're the people to ask, so <laughs> that's why I was asking. Good question, um, honestly. I, I don't know about that. I, I also know that there are like multiple ways of coaching and like writing the string out is not the only way of writing this. But I haven't played with the with the language server plugin yet. Gerald, do you, you know something? Yeah, I, I don't know if I know a whole lot about that. Uh, I, I know there's some some IntelliSense features that at least says, I know your schema, so I can give you suggestions on the fields you're you're writing inside of this query, but that's still not, uh, it's not TypeScript. It's not, I, I, my code is type safe because I have this LSP. It's more just, I, I know I can query this field because uh, I get autocomplete on it. So the, the the build stuff though that you're talking about where it generates the type document node stuff for you, that would also capture inputs. Like we have on line 30, there's a string yeah. input there, then it would also Grab that. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. That's really cool. And then everything stays type safe. Let, let, let's hop projects here. Um, so this is a Next.js project we have. Um, we have a, a few demos in here. So maybe we see something interesting here. Um, because I remember that one of them uses a code gen. So this is like a, a code gen setup. Uh, that's actually interesting to show because code gen can be oh, cool. configured in a myriad of ways. And here it's uh, configured to look for uh, GraphQL files and to create a TypeScript file next to it. So um, if I go uh, go into the components folder here and I have this documents GraphQL and I just write my, my GraphQL queries and uh, admutations here, I get this generated file from it that contains um, the runtime code. So this is already the, the parsed uh, abstract syntax tree that we see here. And this is also typed already for um, for a type document node. So if we are to use that in here. Oh my god. <laughs> I see. I don't, I don't know where exactly <laughs> in here we use it. Um, I guess I can just yeah. You can so just go here. Yeah. And then you see um, that here, the mutation is uh, already typed for the variables that go in. Um, and data, if I, if I would get it out, would be typed. Uh, ah, gotcha. I use it with another hookup here. Cool. Yeah, it's all there. Yeah. So that that's like the... the it even adds the or null or undefined part. Yeah. That's great. So it, can you go back to the documents.generated.ts? Yeah. And maybe format that. Let's see if that helps. Yeah. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah, that does help. So so this file is going to get updated in a loop anytime you save the schema. Is that it? If I have the code gen and watch mode active, yes. Then it would get updated. I mean, right now it's obviously not running. Oh, that's really just nice. just the project. I get you. And here, here you also see that abstract syntax tree that's also quite nice. I mean, we like languages, we like TypeScript. Uh, so 
this is what a language is parsed to internally. Yeah, it's nice to have it all there. And then I also like doing stuff like this. Uh, you, you know, I also like the design of this because a lot of people may not realize it also opens the door to like adjunct tooling. If somebody wants to make an expansion pack on top of your thing, uh, if you kind of give them what they need in order to accomplish that, which, you know, is happening here, then it becomes a lot easier for the community to grow around your solution because people can build on top of it easily. And I think that's really nice. Um, cool. So, so I think that's it. That's the, that's the kind of like we covered the main use case. It seems like when people are interacting with GraphQL servers and they write a client, then they can use this tool to you kind of in the same way that you would use react query or uh, RTK query or something like that and be able to interact with the GraphQL schema, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, GraphQL has int introspection, right? So doesn't, does the user, does the client need to have access to the schema ahead of time always? It doesn't, no. So that it's both a blessing and a curse uh, for Apollo client. Uh, so the blessing is that uh, there are schemas out there that are gigantic. Uh, previously, I, I worked at, at New Relic, and th the generated like schema file that I generated was like 100,000 lines long. So if you're thinking about, like, oh, yeah, it, it makes sense that you want to download that and keep that with it so that everything is always known. Uh, the problem is you're bundling that with your app and 100,000 lines of, of generated code. That's not even runtime code, what you're writing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bloat your, your, uh, your web page pretty quickly. So... Um, so the schema is used a lot. Uh, the code gen that you just saw there, uh, it's it will go and and make an introspection query, um, analyze all of that, and that's how it knows what to generate. Mm -hmm. But Apollo client, uh, Apollo client doesn't know necessarily what your schema looks like at runtime. Hence, why the the things like adding that type name field is important uh, at runtime because that gives us a hint and say, okay, we get this document back, we can compare it to the actual response, and we can see that the field people is this list of underscore underscore type name person type you know and so but we don't need the I we see. don't need the we don't need to know your schema to be able to figure that out so um but yeah it, really it cool. does have its yeah it does have its downsides because uh there are, there are things you can't some certain smarts you can't build into it uh by knowing it ahead of time um yeah so yes it's like api level tree shaking almost or like minification almost yeah that's really neat to be able to leverage that I mean, I mean yeah, the downside sure. of not having the schema is uh, stuff like we don't know about inheritance. So uh, in GraphQL, you can write fragments on like if you say I have a, I have a union type that could return five different uh, things mm -hmm. and I write a fragment, then I say, give me the name if this is of the type uh, person. Um, but if we get uh, the type employee back, which inherits from the type person, we don't know that there's an inheritance going on, so we can't use that field. Uh, like we get it back, but we don't know why and we can't really use it. So um, the coachin also has at that point to generate a, a runtime output for us that shows these inheritance things, it's called possible types. And only if that's in there, we can actually use that information. You have uh, similar things with um, with things like uh, custom scalers, uh, which we at this point don't support because mm -hmm. like a custom scalar would be like, we don't only have integer and string in there, but you have like a date type. Um, but that would mean for us, we have different parsing to apply and we don't know where, like we don't know which field is actually in date field and we, we can't parse it because of that. So if we were to add that, this would also be like a runtime configuration that tells us like, these 10 fields, and if those come back, they are a date and you have to parse them as a date. Um, and of course, that adds complexity on top. Mm -hmm. And you, you start adding the schema back in piece by piece if you if you add all of that stuff. I see. It becomes a bit of a cat and mouse game trying to figure out which part to remove and which part to add. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, uh, I, I wanted to ask, are there any design choices that, I mean, I, I know you guys have only been for, you know, a year or two. But do you, do you know of maybe or have you experienced any design choices that you really, really are happy were made? And on the other side, maybe you could also tell me about design choices that you're <laughs> desperately trying to find a way to walk back. <laughs> um, any learnings about, about about the kind of like overall design of the client? For sure. You want to, you want to start, Lance? 
I I think we can we can like start with the same argument for both. Uh, the types of Apollo client are in most cases uh, really simple, and that's a great thing. Um, like th there is no need for a lot of complexity. Um, we we don't need what what you have in RTK query, for example, where you have that monster type that's inherited everywhere because you need the schema schema available everywhere or something like that. Um, we we don't need that. So the the types in most cases can be very simple. So someone can just uh, like click into them uh, and read them and get a lot of inf useful information out of that. But the backside of that is that these simple types led us to do a lot of type inheritance and there they start to get less simple. That's like, like one of Gerald's absolute pet peeves, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you look at our, uh, our the actual like types behind the use query options, uh, that hook that you saw earlier, uh, and then you start following the the tree of inheritance. Uh, yeah, we have this this type called query hook options. Uh, you're gonna get about five layers deep before you finally get to the kind of top level thing. And it's this combination of of things that you can see query function options. That's another one that inherits from uh, base query options, which inherits <laughs> from uh, watch, query, watch which query options. And with that, okay, that's the top <laughs> level one. Yeah. So, but the problem is like e each type along the way kind of makes a slight modification to the one above it. And so by the time you get to the end, you've got this weird conglomerate of, of, uh, of crazy things. So yeah, in my, in my mind, I, I, I would love to see us kind of flatten these out a little bit more. You do end up with some repetition, but I don't think that's necessarily all bad. Um, the, the thing that, uh, there's a downside of that is you have descriptions if you want to provide good, uh, documentation like inline so you can see in your editor which obviously this does not but we're uh, we're starting to, to really make an effort to focus on that but uh, that gets a little bit trickier because obviously you don't want to copy paste those descriptions everywhere um, lens maybe you want to talk about how we're how we're kind of solving that a little bit but yeah um, um, yeah so uh, that, that's a weird thing um, you you think that something like TS doc would solve that for us um, like there's this uh, this uh, doc block tag uh, inherit doc, where you could just say mm -hmm. like inherit this oh, from really? something else. That. Like, um, oh, th this is like part of ts doc. It's part of js doc. It's part of type doc, uh, and I, I just named three standards, and all of them do it a little bit differently. All of them are not compatible with each other. And then there's uh, VS Code, for example, which uses the TypeScript language server um, to parse these and give us these tooltips. And that one is inspired by TS doc, but it doesn't fully implement it. Uh, and sometimes it also like goes against the specification, which which is weird because TS Doc is from Microsoft and TypeScript is from Microsoft and VS Code is from Microsoft, but there there's not really like uh, a, a common theme going on. Um, so give them a break. It's a big company, all right. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, yeah. Um, so what we did now is that we just thought like, okay, yeah, um, we have a build step. Um, so we just write inherit doc how we want to write it. And we use uh, this syntax, which uh, are, oh my God. Um, <sighs> yeah, that, that's some, yeah. some, some ID type uh, that's used internally by, by TS doc. Uh, so we're doing this and in a build step, we inline these into the TypeScript files that are generated in the build step in the end. Oh. Well, the, womp womp. That, this is, that's uh, the yeah. only way to support every <laughs> editor that has support for like some kind of of comments there. No, I, I get it. I get it. When it's it's funny, like uh, you guys are where the rubber meets the road because you don't have a choice to say, well, I like it better this way or I like it better that way. You have users. The users have needs. You need to fill those needs and you need to find some way. Exactly. So if this if the standards yep. don't line up, it's like you you don't really you're not in a position to complain about it. You need to just get on, you know, put on your 
your boots and fix it. Well, well, right so now that's what you've I'm, done. I'm on YouTube. I'm complaining about it, honestly. Um, but <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can complain Fair about point. it, but yeah, at the end I of mean, the day, I have to criticism. support it. And this is like all we can do. We we have this build step in here, and we're slowly using it to build up like bigger interfaces that don't extend from each other that contain everything um that makes it easier for us to read that makes it more obvious for us which features we actually support because if you in inherit options five level deeps you, you have options in there that you might not even realize are in there if you write the runtime code in the end um and at the end of the day all of these will have all their full documentation but it's a weird way of going there yeah mm -hmm. yeah Actually, um, I want to ask you next, uh, it, we have a good segue. I want to ask you next, what portion of your client base even uses TypeScript? But I have a better segue to that. We've been starting this thing on Michigan TypeScript. Sorry, Lens, last time you were on, we hadn't started it yet, So, but you'll get to answer now. So we just had earlier this week the maintainer, Charles Lowell, the maintainer of Affection, which is like a structured concurrency library, a lot of generators and fun stuff. And I asked him a question that I should ask the next people, which is now you. So I'm going to read you what he he said. Uh, he asked, what are the key metrics you use to measure engagement with your library? Is it like GitHub stars, NPM downloads, commun you know, community forum activity like Discord or something? And then how do you integrate that feedback? So like the question is, how do you take the temperature from your community and then react to it? Oh, that's a good one. That's no pressure. Really one. I'll, ask you to, I'll ask you at the end to, <laughs> to give me your own so you can think about it. But Yeah. yeah. I mean... Like, like, do we want to try to answer it now? We, I, I think we have a few answers to that. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, um, well, then I'll just start. Um, the nice thing is that we have a manager. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to do all of it ourselves. Actually, our manager is doing user interviews and actively, like, asking users... Um, Wow. Uh, like doing a 30 to 60 minute interview, awesome. asking them about their pain points and all of that stuff. And he is planning to extend that. Like we're thinking about having a, like a short uh, link at the end of every closed issue where people can leave a little bit feedback. And then we take some out where we think that could bring us some new insights and we do the user interviews. Of course, we also have GitHub stars. Um, of course, we also have GitHub issues. Like we have, I think about, we're, we're, we're nearing issue 12,000 at some point. Um, we have a few hundred open. Um, we, we're trying to close them. Like we are, we're rotating every week. So an, another person is, uh, uh, is doing the chores there and trying to get a fast answer to every user. We have Discord, we have a forum where we're active. So um, like Stack Overflow, of course. So we, we, we are actively interacting with the community. Um, there are a few Slack channels too. Um, so we, we, we get the feedback, we, we try to incorporate it. Of course, it's, we, we, we're a team of uh, three active developers right now. It's it's more than we can handle, honestly, um, because we, it's mm -hmm. the three of us against like hundreds of thousands of users. Um, <laughs> it's it's too many users, um, yeah. but we we're, we're doing the best we can, and we get a lot of feedback there. Yeah. A while ago, you're reminding me. I, I used to work on a tool called uh, HTTP Snippet which was a tool that translates har archives of like requests into like many programming languages like I don't 30 programming languages so it was fun because I got to I got to have exposure to all these different programming languages and also frameworks within those languages have their own thing but one of the things that I most liked about that project it was not something that I was assigned to it's just I saw it needed maintenance and I eventually picked it up and uh, but it only had like 50 issues and I was so excited cuz I was like this is going to be it. This is the one time in my career I'm going to get a project down to no known bugs, no known issues. <laughs> I can I can merge every PR and work with every and I did. Uh, I was like right before uh, it was like something I was really passionate about and uh, I eventually got it down uh, quite far. Oh, that's amazing. And 
it was uh it's not something i expect to ever happen again i have to say based on what you were just saying lens it's so impressive what you were talking about with your manager uh that's that's a sign of some pretty good leadership actually going out everybody aspires to you know ask their users <laughs> these kinds of things and do these interviews but very few companies actually implement it so hats off to you guys for doing that that's super impressive yeah thank you yeah, Jeff. Jeff's doing a great thing. Yeah, I mean, I, more on the anecdotal front, uh, we we got a chance to go to a bunch of different conferences this year and, and speak. We wanted we want to uh, be engaging with the community that way some more too. So we, we got a lot more uh, in person talk as well. We I, we had a surprising number of people come up and say how much they they love using the client, which was really cool to hear. Um, it's funny you you start as you work on the project and start getting further along going from user to maintainer, you start to see all the, the cracks in the foundation, if you will, and all the the, uh, the the ugly things about it that you'd love to change. And so you, you kind of start developing this perspective of, oh man, there's just so many things that we're not doing right and people are going to hate it because of this. And, and it's just not not quite true. So, um, but uh, yeah, with that too, just uh, we made efforts to spend some time uh, just be available to answer questions. And, and we saw a lot of engagement that way too. Uh, Apollo puts on GraphQL Summit every year. We had a, I think a three, was it three or four hour, uh, what they called a garage session, uh, just during the the days that the conference were happening, just for anybody to come up and ask questions. And we we got quite a bit of engagement that way. So, so I look at that as as positive things. People are interested and people want to know more, and and uh, there's interest there. So, uh, yeah, those goes beyond the the hard coded, you know. Issues are being open. People are chatting in in various uh, areas and whatnot. But yeah, just wanted to throw that out there too. Just just being available to answer questions and seeing people come up is, has been been a great validation that uh, that is still pretty interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I totally feel you on a, on a big project like this, especially open source, it can be so soul crushing to have the issue number, the issue count, like start to creep up. Um, how, how do you guys manage that? I mean, six, you said 16,000. It was like like 12,000 issues about um, like I, I think we're down oh, to I, mean, I guess we can just look here. The, the op- number of open issues yeah, right now. 470. Four, six, 476. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's oh, something realistic. Okay. So we, we, we're trying to stay under the magic number of five hundred there. Um, also, like we we had the goal after we released uh, three point eight, we had the goal of getting down to thirty five pull requests. Um, I, I think we held it there for two days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you still made and it. And then lens went and lens lens went ham, opening a bunch of stuff. So. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I have to give you a hard time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's, no, it's true. It's a good thing. I, I, I think like last week, half of the open pull requests were from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. but we merged a bunch in again. Um, yeah, it's tough because you know those kinds of signals that you, you like they're little scents that people pick up on. They sniff while they're looking at your project. Like, oh, how many issues are there? How many pull requests? And I, I always cringe a little bit when I see comparisons of libraries and. The columns in those comparisons include things like, num- you know, forks, stars, issues, pull requests. There are some projects for which forking it has some like very specific utility and, and therefore many tens of thousands more people fork it. And there are other projects where like the type challenges. Well, the type challenges has tens of thousands of issues. But the reason is not because there's tens of thousands of things wrong. It's because to submit your answer to the TypeScript type yeah. challenges, you make an issue. And that's just how it works. So yeah. I mean, it's like not apples to apples to compare these things. You, you, to be to be fair, uh, if if you're looking for a maintained project um, and an active project, um, it, it it's a good thing to look at issues open versus issues closed. Like, are there people actively maintaining this, caring for it, merging pull requests, interacting with the community, like uh, stuff like that mm-hmm. can be valid. Um, on the other hand, there's also projects out there that are just finished. And they don't need new opened or closed issues or new versions every three days. And lens, lens, be quiet, be quiet. We're, we're TypeScript, we're JavaScript people. We don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't believe in that. What are you talking about? Uh, we'll have to edit I, that I, out, right? <laughs> I, 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 would, I would have brought up, up Redux as like, yeah, that one was finished and we didn't need to do a new release, but we just did a new major last week. So I... I yeah, congratulations <laughs> on that, by the way. I think we can't yeah, do that. I saw that. Um, but but yeah, like like it, it's perfectly possible that you just have like the perfect API shape and the ecosystem around you isn't 
mutating a lot and you don't need to do that um but on the other hand there there's a lot like like in, in graphql the language specification is moving forward uh so we are moving forward of course too um all of the frameworks are moving forward we added support for Next.js uh this year um there's uh an angular client that's a wrapper around apollo client like apollo client itself is uh, language agnostic mm-hmm. um yeah kind of like trpc and react query yeah exactly um right, so exactly. that there's always something happening um and also like this is a project that's I, I got a, i think it's also from 2016 or 17 so it's it's six six or seven years at this point and that's just a bunch of user requests and like a lot of these have been incorporated so there's a ton of features in there and if if you have as many features as that people will also find issues or have like uh Mm -hmm. like new ideas or like they think something should should work in a specific way but another user three years ago requested it to work in a different way so there's just a lot to do alone on the fact that it exists for so long i'll mention too honestly it's this is one of these like perception versus reality things when we did those user interviews something that actually came up quite a bit because my initial thought was oh yeah we're going to get a bunch of feedback on number of issues are important number of pull requests are important that kind of thing but we heard several times from uh from those user interviews that it was not so much that we have 470 issues, but are we are we closing issues? Are we responding to them within a reasonable time? Does it look actively maintained rather than just this? Somebody opens an issue, maybe a year later we'll we'll get to it, or you know, or a month later we'll say, hey, uh, by the way, I see this has been open. So that was that was super important. Yeah, and and I, I think too, it, people don't realize like it, we get probably I don't know four to five issues open a day. I think on average, I would say M- maybe not quite so much. Some days busier than than others, but mm-hmm. um, keeping up with those two. So, but uh, yeah, so it was just one of those perception was oh yeah the the actual count matters and the reality was oh you know it's it's more about just are you engaging are you are you in there are you responding are you making sure that uh, that you're taking care of those that are are coming and asking for help or or wanting to report something so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, how how do you guys uh, manage? It doesn't look that bad to me, by the way. For it, maybe you're being a little hard on yourself. Four seventy five. Uh, I've been in projects, uh, large open source projects that have much more, and uh, it is exactly what you said. Like, where? What's the? I always I would tell the team like, it's about the slope, not the x y coordinates. You know, if the slope is that we're addressing things, you know, that's that's what people want to see. Just like you're saying. So my question yeah. is, how do you manage all of that workload? Do you do you have like rotation on the team? Uh, is it just kind of like hunt and peck? What's the process? Yeah, we we have a dedicated uh, a dedicated what we call caretaker rotation that's weekly. Uh, we just mm-hmm. use PagerDuty. We don't get paged as a client team, uh, open source client team, but we we right. we use that as kind of a means just to to schedule. So it'll be uh, the point person for. Uh, just questions that come up on Discord, questions that come up on our discussion forums, uh, any issues that are open. It's kind of the, the person that's the the first point of contact. Doesn't mean that others can't chime in and, and add uh, comments to things, which happens quite a bit too. Even if you're on on uh, the caretaker rotation, then yeah, uh, the then sign the of others will, will come in. Exactly, exactly. So. Uh, but we, we always want to make sure that we have somebody that can at least watch that, uh, that can be in charge of it. Because a lot of times, too, we're heads down focused on moving something forward. And uh, you want to be able to dedicate time to focusing on that. So having a kind of a point of point of contact there has been uh, super fruitful for us. So have there been any features that people have requested recently that you could show us that were kind of the start to finish or things that you're proud of that have been implemented in the last little while, a couple months, year, whatever? No, sus- suspense is kind of the big one. Uh, React suspense is, it itself is an interesting story because it was demoed so long ago. Uh, yeah. I think 2019, if I'm not mistaken, was like the first demo of anything suspense related. And yeah. and if you look at uh, our past issues, we've had we've had requests for suspense forever. But uh, yeah, we, we delivered on that this year. This year is actually the first year that the React team has said, okay, you know, it's it's more stabilized. You can start using it uh, outside of just react.lazy. 
Um, but yeah, we, we started with this RFC. Uh, I wrote this up and this was a, a great way to get some feedback. This was really kind of the, the high level design. What options are we thinking of adding it in? What are the, the considerations we're making here? Um, obviously, it's a paradigm shift within, uh, within React itself on, on how you actually use, uh, use this stuff. Uh, so yeah, we, we tried to lay this out. We got we got a, a good amount of uh, feedback and and questions in here that that definitely helped us uh, that influenced how how we designed some of this stuff. Yeah. And some of this too, we found out like we were uh, we we're a little bit naive. And this is also written in the perspective of adding SSR support uh, with the new React 18 goodies. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, Lens, you can chime in here in a second, and he'll, he'll tell you uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, it's experimentation we did and we found out there's actually uh, there's a lot of limitation to SSR so we couldn't deliver on that but we could at least do the the client side uh suspense stuff um but yeah I, lens maybe you can you can talk about that as well because i i think the the next js rsc stuff is super interesting yeah i, I would just say like oh i i think a lot of what, what you had to do here was um not only like what do we want to support and how it's going to look but also what features are we not going to support? Um, because yeah. the 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 use query hook has a ton of features, and not all of them make really sense in in um, in suspense, and a few of them also lead our users into code that's probably not optimal. Um, and we just noticed that like years after they had been in there, we can never remove a feature. Uh, this was. A blank slate to create new hooks uh, to do new things. So a lot of time went into trying out how it works, uh, which patterns it, it uh, that you have coming up in the end, um, and also like doing thing, doing access like not having an uncompleted or on error uh, callback and stuff like that um, is is super important. Mm -hmm. And all of that happened like, like Gerald wrote this up last year in October. And we we had like the first alpha shipping with it in March, I think, or March or April, I think. And then there was still a discussion going on mm -hmm. until until October, um, until we had those first two hooks fleshed out, or the first three hooks. Um, and right now we're we're adding more hooks on top to support more suspensy things. Like Charles actively working on that right now, but this is like. A very long ongoing story um the, the great thing is that we don't get a lot of feedback like hey you did it wrong uh which is really encouraging um users are also not really coming up with a lot of bugs or something so yeah. uh like the general is doing his due diligence there and the the tests are, are, are crazy like there are like one new hook two thousand new tests or something like that so uh, that's the in inhuman but but absolutely amazing what i did was at some point i, I installed next next js and just tried the hooks and everything failed like <laughs> um <laughs> because uh what next js does and what we didn't realize at that point with the app directory is it does also do a server-side render of client components and we didn't have a way of transporting the data that was already fetched on the server to the client. So essentially you did suspense on the server, mm -hmm. the components paused, they fetched the data, they started rendering. Does it twice. And then they did it in the browser again. And mm -hmm. going through that was uh, a learning experience, also learning um, React server components when they were really fresh. If someone's interested in that, it's definitely yeah. not the core of, of today. Um, but there's this RFC that I, I wrote up in a very long discussion with Dan Abramov. Like he did a ton of review on this. And I think we went through five iterations or so. Um, that just explains like the whole image, um, possible uh, race conditions between server and client. Um, it has like graphics like this, uh, like you, you can read for hours <laughs> in, in this one. Uh, the good thing is we, we got it running it, wow. and it's working. Uh, the bad news is it's only working in Next.js and not generally in React because right now React is not shipping the primitives we would need to support it everywhere. Um, so we 
can support the old type of SSR, we cannot support the new type of streaming SSR because right now React is missing the primitives for that. We have to tap into the framework, which is not perfect and a little bit worse than what we could do otherwise. But for now, it is what it is. Um, we're in contact with the React team and we're hoping that not with React 19, but maybe with a, an early minor like 19.1, 19.2, we get those primitives or at, at the latest with React 20, but that would be a, well, I, I, let's hope for a yeah. faster release than going from, from 16 to 17 or from 18 yeah. to 19. And is the reason that Next.js doesn't have this problem is because they kind of implement it themselves? Yeah. Um, well, Next.js has a hook that allows you to inject data into the stream. Um, and we, oh, okay. like, like they use that for right. CSS uh, and we use that to inject the data into the stream as well. It's it's not perfect because we can't do things like keeping the stream open indefinitely. Like we know we are still fetching data, even if it's not rendered out, we still want to transport it over or something. Um, but uh, yeah, we we can use it for what we have available. It's, it's better than nothing. But every other framework or every other person who would do streaming SSR would have to re-implement what Next did there, and that's not optimal. And it also creates so much, well, like we saw with the inherit doc thing from JS doc or whatever, it creates opportunity for incompatibility, and unintentional incompatibility. You know, even even the worst kind of incompatibility, which is behavioral, the, you know, with the APIs match, but they actually do like subtly different things that can be very terrifying. Yeah. I was thinking a couple of times during what you were just explaining that it's a, uh, it's very daunting working on a project like Apollo client and hats off to you guys. Uh, it's very daunting to be able to put something fresh out there, especially with a new technology, like whatever suspense, SSR, you name it, because if you make a mistake early on or the community takes it a different, we've seen that in the react community uh, quite a few times that something happens, the community takes it one direction and then we later decide, oh, actually, that wasn't, you know, there were React mixins in the beginning, right? Uh, <laughs> right. And nobody knows what those are anymore. There were uh, higher order components were like the solution to all problems for a time. Like nobody, it's not suggested anymore. So like things change. And then as a library author, you can just get stuck in the cracks. You know, you get stuck there in the gap where you did the right thing for the time, but it's so hard to go back sometimes. So on that note, I wanted to ask, are there things that are the decisions that you guys have made, uh, you know, working on this that you wish you could unmake or things that have changed under your feet that you would have liked to know in the beginning? Does anything uh, come to mind? Let, let's put that on break for a second. Like I, I want to say for once, you're totally oh, okay. right. Yeah. We, we have the higher order components here um, and they we, we still ship them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we we also have the, uh, the render prop things somewhere here and we still ship them. And just wanted to remember, we are on, uh, on TypeScript here. So... Uh, we we are also talking about the hooks, so I wanted to say we we have a few complex types in here, and use suspense query is one of those, where it just has like mm. um, two million overloads. Show me the dirt. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like for, for one, we have we have this overload, um, which just is the inference overload. Like, Gerald, you, you've written them. Do you, do you want to explain a bit in I scroll? Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple of things here. So uh, we're, we're looking at it through the lens of how are people going to try and pass queries into use suspense query? Um, and then also, how, are, how do you use options? Because the options you supply may affect the actual type of the data that's returned. So uh, in one case, you saw that type document node that we had earlier uh, that lets you specify the, the data and variables, but we don't want that to be the only way. We also want you to be able to do explicit, uh, if you will, type arguments. So you can call use suspense query and then provide the, the generic arguments uh, to it then and there. So it, this has is kind of a combination of both. The, the first overload that you see in here is really for that type document node case. And then we're trying to figure out, okay, are you giving us partial data or do you want partial data back uh, if we have it in the cache? Mm -hmm. Are you providing us with an error policy that uh, means we're not going to throw the error anymore, in which case you might not get data back at all. That's going to affect whether or not you get 
uh, potentially undefined for your data property. Um, yeah, you can see here, like return partial data, if you pass that, it means that you, we, we don't know what of your data is available and what's not, because we'll just give you whatever's in the cache. So we have to do this like deep partial type uh, throughout all this. So yeah, so first overload is really about this. You use type document node, supply some options to, to use suspense query, and then that's going to affect the return type of it. The, the other overloads that you see in here are really for that case where you pass in the arguments directly to the type arguments directly to use suspense query, where you say, okay, I, I, uh, I have my, my data type, and then I'm going to pass uh, return partial true and error policy ignore, and that's going to that's gonna give you this type here. Um, and, and we've got all these overloads to, to help with those types. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're really trying to, to handle it all. This is one thing, actually, if you look at use query, uh, it doesn't do this as robustly. Um, there, there's some some improvements we definitely can make to use query to make it more what you'd actually see at runtime than what it is right now. Right now, it's a little bit too lax, if you will, uh, in that we can. There's uh, cases where we can give you like we know it's not undefined anymore, but uh, unfortunately, the type says it's going to be undefined, so you have to you know use. Uh, do some gymnastics. Yeah, exactly. To to get around that, but so is, is that the reason you still have the higher order components? Yeah, well, users use them, um, and we haven't done a major in a while, so we can't just throw them away. <laughs> okay. um, we we're gonna deprecate them probably mm -hmm. with the next major yeah. and put them in a separate bundle, not on the main bundle anymore. Um, I mean, they they are shaking out battery shaking right now, um, but we, we kind of want to get them a little bit out of sight there. Uh, one thing is we, we did yeah. some changes to use query, for example. We added this no infer because usually you don't want to pass in additional variables and change that your whole value with variable types, but you want to be warned if you accidentally specify variables that should not be in there. Um, and even this small change brought us into a, an issue discussion that was like like 30 comments long. Uh, about a person that was using this query hook options as the source of inference instead of using the query as the source of inference. So this is something that has been existing for a long time, so we can't just get rid of it. And we can't just make it better because people are using some quirk of it. Um, and and we're, we're back to that point where like every, everything we do better here is a breaking change for someone. Uh, and that's where your suspense query just allows us to to do it right from the beginning. And that's also like these types we, we've seen that last time with uh, with RTK query, but also here if we use it uh, if we look at the tests um, of uh, hooks tests here uh, of use suspense query, um, somewhere at the bottom here we have the type tests. Um, Mm -hmm. Or are they in here? Yeah, you might be able to look just for oh, type yeah. tests. Yeah, you're reading my uh, mind. I was going to ask you next uh, yeah. about testing and type testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is like easy test for the uh, for the inference uh, stuff. Oh, nice. We we don't specify anything. Uh, this is even like completely unknown. Works. Um, then we have like the the testing that. Like why the variables can't can't be passed in. Um, yeah, here, here we have typed typed document notes already. Um, so we're we're checking for the mm -hmm. correct inference on those. So now we we can do all what that. What is this with a new to code. equal type of? That's from what, what is this uh, to equal type of function from, from what's in a v test? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. That's. Expect type. It's it's from a package called expect type, yeah, oh, uh, cool. which I think is bundled as part of VTest. We're using Jest here, so we we have to install it. But uh, yeah, it's super helpful for for these types of type tests. I love it, and you got a knot in there, so like that's a uh, that's pretty that's pretty powerful. You can't for those that don't know, you can't do that in TypeScript very trivial. Well, at all really, um, you have to be more specific. You, there's no knot operator in the type system. So yeah. that's kind of uh, right. pretty pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say what you were reminding me of is the the XKCD 
space bar heater thing. Have you ever seen that one? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it comes up every you know, day. It's tough. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh, all the time. It's, it's all fun and games in the first five years of a project, but once you get kind of further down the road, there becomes these weird philosophical cliffs that you find yourself standing over like, okay, well, it's not really a bug, but it's also not really something we want to keep. Uh, but also people are using it and we're, our whole goal is supposed to be to satisfy our users, but like, is there a greater good here? So it can be very difficult to make those decisions. I, I really understand. Um, so this is the testing. Is this, can you show me quickly what uh, it would be? We'd be remiss to leave this discussion without talking about what testing looks like for users. Uh, how does a user write tests when they're using Apollo client? You it kind of ignore the question. fact that you yeah. use Apollo client, um, uh, like for the normal test part. Um, but of course you still want to mock your, your server in some way. And uh, mm -hmm. that's something that right now we have this uh, mock provider. Uh, Gerald, I, I look for it. You, you explain a little bit. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the the idea is uh, in your in your tests, you're probably not going to be executing actual HTTP requests to your server, um, especially because if you want to test uh, variations of your component, like what happens if uh, when it's in its loading state, what happens when it's uh, when yep. I get an error back, what happens when I click refetch and it errors, you know, those types of things. You want to be able to control the return you get back from there. So uh, for for several years, uh, yeah, Mock Provider has been our way to do that. So essentially, it just wraps your, your uh, components uh, that you're testing and will um, will provide these these canned responses. You can see that that mocks variable there. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the idea is that we'll we'll basically try and match what query are you executing uh, against your server, quote unquote, uh, and any variables that would match against that. And then here's the result that you want to return back uh, when it matches this particular uh, this particular query. So um, yeah, like like Len said, if you're you're after the the idea of like the React testing library. Um, Test like your users are going to use it. Your new users aren't looking at, uh, oh, uh, use query happened to set loading to true. No, it's it's that uh, what happened. Like, am I showing the loading state when loading is true? Type of thing. So you want to you want to simulate yep. that. So yeah, so mock provider just gives you a way to to mock out the actual request part of it, and then yeah, you test it. Um, this these are probably bad tests because we're testing specifically uh, no, <laughs> use query itself. Me. We're using that render hook. Uh, yeah, so it's this isn't going to resemble what you do in in app code, yeah. but um, but yeah, then, then you just test your component in in those various states uh, and make sure that it can handle those things as you would expect. And you ship mock provider so that users can use the same structures. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so that's Great. all. That's all wow. part of the install. Yeah, and this wonderful. is uh, th this has been the the uh, the kind of I guess only solution we've had for a long time. I'll, I'll just mention too. So our our third colleague Alessia, who uh, unfortunately couldn't make this call, uh, is is working on an RFC and and some really neat new testing uh, utilities that we're going to be announcing hopefully you know at, at some point in time in the the near future that uh, will make this a little more robust. There's a, there's some shortcomings that. We don't have to get into with mock provider, but we, we want to provide some more robust utilities for those that are are using Apollo client to uh, to better test your applications, give you a little more confidence in, in what you're getting back. And so um, we're we're we'll have a, another set of of uh, testing utilities shipping with this um, in a minor version at some point in the future. So, uh, awesome. but yeah, at least right now, mock provider is your your kind of key to uh, handling the the mocks from your your actual GraphQL requests. Yeah, I have a, you know, testing is a is a thing that I think is really important as a library that you're thinking about, and it's clear you were all thinking about it, so that's wonderful. I always used to joke when I would uh, evaluate uh, UI libraries, you know, like Material UI, or, or I guess it's MUI now, or uh, Blueprint or something like that. The first thing I would always do is go look at the date picker, because the date picker, for those <laughs> uh, yeah. who don't know, is preposterously difficult to get right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like yeah. absurdly challenging. Um, I always tell people you can hate on jQuery, but the jQuery date picker is perhaps the most mature date picker 
that has ever existed, but it has like 50 options. But the reason it has those options right. is because this stuff is complicated. Yeah. So I always do the same. Th anyway, I'm just saying I do the same thing when I look at a library. I try to f find in their docs, do they talk about testing? Do they provide, like you are here, stuff for, for me to be able to do testing well? Because if they have, it's a pretty good indication that this is a pretty well thought out, pretty mature project. So I always love to see that kind of stuff. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, awesome. There, there's yeah. also one part in here, um, and that's like, we we are working on a testing story for our users but at the same time essentially we want to test the library very differently from that um mm. the thing is yeah. our, our user should use the react testing library approach that we also see in in, in this older test here like look at it mm -hmm. from like what am I putting in? What I'm what what HTML is getting rendered in the in the best case? Like I have the user click this button, and then then I see, like is this, this text somewhere on the page after a while? Um, but from a library yep. perspective, especially like a data fetching library perspective, we need to care about every single render. And if you if you use that uh, RTL approach, um, it, you, you sometimes skip a render like like you you don't notice it's in there in between uh because your you test might just in ci run a bit a little bit slower or something um so we we've actually started to test our library in a completely different way and a way that i i would never encourage a user to test their application but it's pretty cool so i thought i, I can also show that it's an, an use load yeah, library it. test yeah, right well our, our audience here is library authors anyway, uh, predominantly. So yeah, this Beautiful. is perfect. So what what we're doing here is... Yeah, we, we got a few tests. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, we are using the... <laughs> Sorry, there's, a, there's some... Steps. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, we're starting with the first tests here. Um, we are using a, a wrapper around the, the React profiler. Um, so there, there's this almost never used components react profiler that you can wrap around a tree and it notifies you after every render that happened and we we build our own tool around that really uh so we have this use track render hook that that's important and then we have like this component and we have a few other components like um like suspense fallback and the read query hook component that uh, also track their renders. This is quite important for us to track these. Um, and then we um, we just render this thing, and then we we use an iterator approach. Essentially, we we take renders and then we look at these renders, like what happened in this render. So we, we say, wow. give us the next render from our, our queue of renders that might have already happened or will happen <laughs> soon in the future. And just say like, in the render components of that um, has app, like like which components re-rendered? And we say like app should have re-rendered. And then we, we take another render from the stack and we say, uh, the next time app and suspense fallback should have re-rendered. And the next time the query hook wow. should have re-rendered. So you're doing, you're like kind of, wow, you're, you're like puppeteering React itself and saying, okay, now you can do your next render. What was it? Okay, now you do your next render. Well, what was it? Well, and making sure, we, wow. We would love to, but we can't. But but we record all of them. And then you it, even, if re, sure, sure. It, even if React did it's it 10 same. minutes ago, the test steps through it render by render. And we, we even uh, like where we create the profiler, um, we have a few more options in here. Um, so we can take uh, DOM snap snapshots. So which every render that happened, um, we can uh, look at the DOM snapshot and then we can say, Oh, wow. Oh, uh, wow. I actually don't remember how exactly this works. I think it's the within DOM. Ah, yeah, it's, within DOM. Yeah, you, you call, you do the within DOM. Yeah. yeah. And then you do what you usually do that with the is... React testing library. Uh, everything that you usually have at your hands in React testing library, you have with this DOM snapshot from probably 10 minutes ago. 
Um, and, and that allows us to like really do what a library should do when it's testing, like guarantee how many renders happened, when they happened, what the DOM looked like in that moment, what data every component had at their, like their components can save snapshots render to the side. Render by render. All of that stuff. Wow. This is incredible. Yeah, because that's the important thing too, like especially with a couple of these hooks where we have two connected. This is one of these where where you have one hook that kind of produces this thing, and then another hook that reads it and suspends. But that that hook that reads and suspends, we only want to re like if we do a cache update, for example, we want to make sure a that it has the latest data. But we also want to make sure that that hook is the only one that re-renders the component, not your top level one, because it doesn't have anything that needs to care about that updated data. So like this, this has really helped us kind of step through that and say, okay, now let's produce a cache update and make sure that only the component that we think is rent should be re-rendering is actually doing the re-rendering here. Um, yeah. Hence this, this whole kind of rendered components approach. So this uh, is, this is some yeah. state of the art stuff here. I mean, did you, did you see someone else doing this or like who, who came up with this? How did, where did this come from? That was just a random idea I had. Lens. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lens. <laughs> Yeah, lens, come on! This is incredible. Yeah, oh my. It's, it, it's pretty cool. Wow. The, the idea is we're gonna open source it at some. I mean, it, it's an, an open source code base. Of course, it's open source, but we 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 want to make it a, like a package at some point. The thing is, right now we're using it, Absolutely. and we want we want to have like ten thousand tests or something like converted to it, so we know just like what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Uh, we. We, I actually this would be introduced incredible. this, this because, so because we had um, some very flaky tests for our higher order components. And like these are class components. I, I don't want to think about that anymore. Um, but they, they did stuff mm -hmm. like expect, expect calls during render and counting renders during the render function and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. React Agent came around, and suddenly um, everything like that would be would be caught by React, and it wouldn't bubble up to to chest anymore. So we needed a way around that um, because we, we just thought like, oh, we're seeing less right. renders it, it's because React more eighteen now. But React yeah, eighteen because, just, is that because React eighteen? It, it it's like. Like React 18 has an implicit error boundary around everything. Um, so if if you and also it it can re-render things multiple times. Yeah, Sometimes. like like render counts exactly. changed anyways with from React 17 to 18. Um, yes. So we we, exactly. we thought like maybe it's just React 18 being more efficient and great. Our old hooks are, are more efficient, and then then it started flip flopping and we we started looking further into it, and it was more like react 18 was just catching the error but didn't re-render after that so that's why we were seeing less renders and that's why we needed this approach essentially um for the old class components well i i highly encourage you to package this uh sooner than a thousand <laughs> tests from now uh this is this is really cool this is super duper cool not to like <laughs> apollo client is cool too i am so impressed by this anyway i guess oh, it shows you. uh yeah super cool stuff well we, we, we could probably go ahead go ahead i'll just say i'll just say one more thing yeah it, part of the reason that we're, we're waiting a little bit too like this is the first actual full test suite uh using the profile in literally every test uh and even just writing these there was a, a decent number of like of changes we made to to some things just to totally to be able to handle certain cases so yeah we're, we're just trying to get some of those real rough edges out with it and make sure we have enough uh enough use case and we're not missing something glaringly obvious uh but yeah this one said we'll we'll, we'll package for, it for library authors like for later. anybody who's confused why this is so cool the, the thing is that when you're a library you can't just write a test of a user clicking a button there is no user there is no button there is no app you're a library so you get into this kind of weird lock locking situation you get deadlocked with your own use cases because you need to like then create an app that you can test just to just to see that the library works. That's what's so cool about this is that it gives you that opportunity to write these kinds of tests without so much of the baggage, you know? I mean, there's still a lot of a lot of setup <laughs> in in there. Like you, you still have to write that app, um, sure. but but observing it becomes a lot more predictable. Um, 
where where in a in a real yeah. life app you're you're mostly concerned that the app loads and is in the in the right final state you, you don't care if there's like a half render with, with half this data half that data it will disappear in a millisecond and the user will never notice it but if if we as a library as yeah. the first step already make that error uh, we we ship it to hundreds of thousand users then hundreds of thousand users have that error and they have that inconsistent data somewhere in there uh, so we have to make sure from the beginning that every single render is perfectly on point. And React Testing Library wasn't giving us that. Um, it's it's made for applications, not for libraries. Totally. Well, uh, this has been a very enlightening conversation. I, I wanted to ask you, I have three follow-up questions, so I'll, t- I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> the first one's going to be, where, where do you think this is going next? Maybe in your case, that depends on you know the GraphQL spec and other things, but um, where do you think Apollo Client is headed next? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard. It's hard to say because there's so many things that we have yet, I feel like, to to do and and work on even yet. Um, obviously, like recently has been really just trying to embrace a lot of the, the new React uh, features. Um, obviously, there there's the Apollo client core, which is yep. framework agnostic, but with with suspense, with server components, those kinds of things, you know, our, our focus has really been trying to 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 cater to uh to those use cases because because react right now is the the predominant uh tool that you're using for for building uis um for sure. so it makes sense that our, our focus has been there but uh just on the graphql front there's uh there's a lot of really cool stuff happening with with graphql right now um there's uh there's defer and stream uh which are new uh new directives that allow you to do uh streaming uh queries essentially just uh, get part of, part of your query in and then uh, defer some of your results in case maybe you have a slow field or something that you're okay just streaming in when it's ready to go. Those are all things that we're trying to be kind of at the forefront. Uh, there's new ideas from uh, the Relay team, actually, that we're, we're kind of collaborating on for, uh, for awesome. nullability and error handling. Uh, some new use cases there that are pretty exciting. Uh, nullability is, is also a big topic in just GraphQL in general. This idea of uh, of true nullability for for those that have followed uh, GraphQL at all right now fields you'll see that a lot of fields in GraphQL are recommended to be nullable by default mostly because uh, if those fields error they get nulled out um, but it doesn't actually there's not a you don't know whether it's a, a true null value it, is it is it because this field actually can be null or is it because you want to allow for a space for error so there's a lot of uh, where I'm going is there's a lot of iteration on just the GraphQL spec happening as well. So, um, so yeah, I would I would say we're we're trying to both kind of take this uh, hitting on some of the the new React stuff, but also trying to keep up with uh, the GraphQL spec to make sure we can serve those users uh, and and have that stuff ready to go early on. But yeah, Lens maybe maybe have some other stuff to add there too. Yeah, I mean there, there's also like the other the other side of that. Um, uh, this is a library uh, that's accumulated a lot of features. We just finished or yeah. are in the moment of finishing a big sprint that's going into uh, potential memory leaks. Um, and like, I've spent a lot of time hunting for those. Um, so the next release will be a lot more memory efficient. Um, there's also maintenance stuff uh, or like keeping up with the ecosystem. The whole ESM story um, mm-hmm. it yeah. is <laughs> oh, yeah. it's horrible. Here we are, um, years later, yeah. <laughs> still, still dealing with it. Yeah, we, we are still de- dealing with it. We, we are shipping modules, but we are currently not, <laughs> not shipping the the exports field because that would be a breaking change. So we need to do the major release for that. Um, when we do that major release, we also want to drop uh, some of the polyfills out. We want to up the compilation target, which will then result in a smaller library footprint uh, a smaller smaller bundle size because right right now if if you do a, a null coalescent operator or something it, it's going to be like three times the amount of code because it gets transpiled down and we we ship that to all of our users yeah. because this version of apollo client is compatible with internet explorer and we don't use proxies and all of that stuff um so we we need to make that step at some point, um, like generally looking at um, what what can we move out of the main bundle, where can we do more tree, split, uh, tree shaking and stuff like that. Um, 
and then there's also like other stuff like uh, looking into into astro um we we know that mm. people are using astro we know that people are using apollo client with astro um but like if, if they are using a one apollo client and they're using uh, it's possible to use like react and view and probably also angular in there like would would people use the same apollo client with all of these how would they do it uh, do we have the right patterns in place for people to use that actually which which right now yeah. like astro doesn't like you to use context but our hooks rely a lot on context so is that the right, right way for us to go do we need to document that better all, all of that chess um is something like we we, we want to yeah. look into um Oh, like okay. the, the list is long. Too many things. The list is long. <laughs> too many yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, because you could get a picture. Uh, yeah, there's 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 always so much to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I'm glad you guys have the clarity of mind, though, to be able to just spout those things off. It shows how engaged you are with your project and um, how aware you are of what your users' needs are. So I, I love to see all that stuff. That's that's awesome. Uh, all right, the time has come. What's your question for the next person? What would you like them? What would you like me to ask? It can be anything. It can be about. It doesn't have to be about your library, but it can be about, uh, you know, your favorite tikka masala recipe or something. I don't know. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, uh, man, what, I'm not good with this kind of thing. But what what's a conference you never visited but would like to visit? Great. All right. That's a great one. Um, I'll really I'll be sure one. to ask it. And then final question. So a bit of a, I mean, it's kind of, it's not really a plug because it doesn't exist, but you know, there's the state of JavaScript survey and state of CSS and there's also state of GraphQL. You guys are aware of this, right? Yeah. But yep. there's no state of TypeScript. And I don't mean uh, kind of the state of JavaScript plus questions about types. I mean, like really focused on the library author experience about using TypeScript. Almost like if you think of it, if there were like a state of React or, or something like it would ask questions maybe about needing a profiler to be able to do these kinds of things. Do you have anything that you wonder about your users that you think would be good on a state of TypeScript survey? Is there any question you ask yourself sometimes where it's like, oh, I wonder how many users, uh, well, maybe you wonder how many users need higher order components or something like that. I would be very interested in uh, what TypeScript features people have disabled. Like what what does the TS config look like? Uh, what What build target are they going for? Do they have unchecked index access on? Are they on strict mode? Like 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 stuff like that. Um, because we mm. we have to kind of like to get the ninety five percent of users out there. We, we we would have to know that when when we're writing our code. Uh, we, we we have no idea. Like like otherwise you have to guess. We, yeah, we have to yeah. guess. Great. Yeah, great question. So it doesn't exist, like I said, but Michigan TypeScript kind of came into some people that are interested in working on that, and we have the domain for it anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we're thinking that we might actually sometime in 2024 start putting something together so that by the end of 2024 we can release it uh, and do a kind of year wrap up. So I think it's good to ask people, you know, you're, you're the people to ask that question because you're the people who would be using that information to make informed decisions about building your library. So we're going to keep asking yeah, people sure. over the next year. Cool. All right. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate going through all this stuff. And I, I love how deep we got into some of these things. Uh, very excited to see you seem like a very healthy team with a lot of really interesting problems to solve. Uh, and yeah, I'm just so impressed by Apollo client. And uh, I'm definitely gonna I haven't used Thank it before, <laughs> I said, but uh, I'll definitely be checking it out next time. Awesome. And uh, I know who to bug if I have yeah. any questions, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Hit us up as much as you want. <laughs> Where can people find you guys? Yeah, you can find me online. So at Gerald Miller, uh, the nice thing about having a unique name is that I get pretty much uh, claims to any handle I want. So yeah, at Gerald Miller on GitHub, on Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it these days. Uh, yeah, um, those are probably the, the two you can reach me the most. Yeah, for, for me, it's uh, at Franias, um, or on Twitter, it's at Fry, because... I'm an early time user and it was free at that time. I, generally, like you, you can do the test right into uh, into the GraphOS Discord um, in, in the front end section, write a question, see how long it takes us to, to respond. Um, like measure that maybe. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. Yeah. yeah thanks for having fun. us on. This was a ton of fun. So thank you. <laughs>